when I got back from El Salvador, the first thing I said to my parents when I got off that plane was just thank you. I would definitely recommend this program. Um, it's just a great way to get a different perspective and learn about different countries and different cultures. And they sang Stand By Me in English to us and everybody was crying at that point because it was just overwhelming emotions. How are they cheering for all of us and Father Ron? Like, what did we do for them? Marie took me out of my, my cocoon and said, you've got to dare to try new things. And so um, uh, I'm glad I did. Above all, I'm glad I went with students who just uh, were amazing people to be with. And I really uh, learned a lot from them. Why do you find people coming back and back and back? People like Father Lally, people like me, people like Father Ron. It's, it's like a kind of falling in love in the sense that you really learn what love is. Sometimes people say, well, you know, you, you know you're, what are you doing? It's, it's just a small group of people somewhere on the other side of the world. You know, you're, you're not saving the world. And I think about that and I think, well, you're right. You know, I'm not saving the world. But uh, if I can help save a small part of the world, that's not bad. That's wonderful. Well, it goes back a good number of years to my time as chaplain at Scranton Prep. I was invited by a Jesuit in our province who was running a service program uh, in Guadalajara at a Jesuit orphanage. And uh, he said, you have to come down here. You have to experience this yourself. I said, well, all right. So I worked out going down and I spent a week with them. And uh, the first night we were in the dining hall with, with these hundreds of, of children. And um, at the end of the meal, they were passing around this cardboard box. And the kids were all going in and, and taking something out. I thought, ah, they're, they're getting ice cream, you know, or they're getting candy at the end of the meal. So I thought, well, that's good. You know, that's, it's nice to give them something sweet. When the box finally came around to where I was seated, I realized what they were reaching in to grab were crusts of bread, uh, uh, the kind of crusts that are cut off uh, white bread for like fancy sandwiches. They probably got them donated from hotels. And that was their treat. Uh, I never forgot that. I've never not eaten a crust of bread after that. Saint John Paul II had said, if you want to be of service to people, grow an understanding of them. You have to understand people to understand what their deeper needs are, which may not be obvious. I was on the edge of Mexico City under a volcano. It was in this uh, uh, very picturesque area, but they were really children of the streets and uh, who were sent there uh, to, uh, to be taken care of, but sometimes by the government, sometimes by their families, sometimes they were just found on the streets and brought in. And our, the, our job there was to build a bridge of understanding to them. And his university had sent a delegation to El Salvador 
to be in solidarity with the people there during and at the, right at the edge of their terrible civil war. His story was so compelling. I just said, we have, to do, we have to do this for the faculty and staff. It's wonderful to send the students places, but uh, for the multiplier effect, we really need to open up in a deeper way the understanding of the faculty and staff to the problems, the challenges, and the goodness of the people in the developing world. We founded a program, and we called it Bridges to El Salvador. El Salvador. Well, you can't say that without saying Father Lally. Brendan Lally started the Bridges to El Salvador program in 1999. As soon as I heard it announced, I didn't know him that well, but I said, Father Lally, um, you're taking me and how many others? And he said, uh, and who are you? But I ended up going with him that first year, and it really changed my life. Father Lally is a big proponent of being present. It's hard to be present in a reality that is so overwhelmingly sad. I'm not a big proponent of that because I think we have to solve all these problems. So we made a good team. Every family had stories of, of death, of torture, of horrendous uh, atrocities that I can't even, I don't even want to verbalize. When we had first gone there, we got into a, a van, and we had a van driver and a guide, and we got lost in the mountains, naturally. So there we were in the middle of nowhere in this small little village, and I got out, and there was an old woman standing there. Her name was Theodora, and she said that her husband and son worked in the fields for a wealthy landowner. One day, while they were in the fields, and she was out there with them, uh, the death squads came, and they, they killed her husband and her son in her presence and dismembered their bodies with machetes and burned them in her presence. And she said, I, I, I walked away from it in shock. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I'm an old woman. My husband and my son are dead. I have no income. I have no support. What, 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 what can I do? What should I do? And then she says, I thought about it. And she said, I thought what I'll do is I'll do what Jesus would do. She said, and I, she says, I decided that day to go spend the rest of my life going around the village, taking care of all the elderly sick people who had no one to care for them. So her response to the tragedy and atrocity in her life was to return love and kindness to others. I'll never forget that. After a few days, I realized that the best thing to do was keep listening to their stories and just try to figure out what had happened here. Because my knowledge of El Salvador was not all that great at the time. And just listening to their stories and researching when I got back everything that I could, um, I really decided I had to go back right away, again. Marie and I were party to all these uh, experiences, and uh, it just deepened our determination to do something permanent, to try to do something practical. After my third time, I said, Father, I cannot just be present here as if I've never been here before. We weren't experts in uh, international service programs. We were just people who were on the scene and felt a need to respond. We felt called to respond. As educators, uh, you know, what's, what is it that we can do to make a difference in the developing world? We can certainly collect money to uh, provide food and, and, and housing and so forth. But the real ticket to, uh, to success and for people to transcend their, their humble environment 
is education. We rediscovered a school in San Salvador called the Santa Luisa School. It was run by uh, three nuns, three daughters of St. Paul from Central America. And uh, it, the school had about 400 children in it. It was in the worst neighborhood in San Salvador. Very dangerous because of the gangs and violence and so forth. The school has high walls around it, razor wire at the top. Inside the school was a city of joy. Uh, the kids were like kids in any kind of a school. It could be in a Scranton Catholic school or a Philadelphia a, a parochial school. And I would go into the classrooms and I would say to the children, okay, what's your favorite thing to do? The hands would all go up and they'd say, go to school, go to school. And they weren't prompted to do it. It came so spontaneously. Uh, because even in their early years, they realized that it was going to be an education that was going to take them out of the poverty that they, their families came from to the possibility, not a guarantee, but the possibility of a better life. We went to the, this one little town of Las Delicias with uh, a sister uh, who uh, uh, introduced us to this small community, and we would go there and we would celebrate Mass with, with the people. Uh, sometimes the, the children would put on uh, uh, a performance for us. They would dance, they would sing, and uh, we all fell in love with these children and their lives. Uh, and, uh, and to be able in any way to plant hope in the heart of a person who doesn't have it, what a gift, you know? Not just, not for the, I'm not even talking about the person, receiving it. What a gift for us to be players in that, in that process. Two particular programs spun out of this. One was uh, the Scope Foundation, uh, made up of Scranton alumni. What we do is we uh, invite people to sponsor a child. You see a lot of these kind of things on TV. The difference being that 100% of the money given goes directly to the school. None of us are salaried. We pay for the, the pictures ourselves. And they will send us a nice photograph of each of the children. And for $60 a year, uh, we'll invite people to sponsor a child. And pray for the child. Put the picture up on your wall. Frame it. Remember them. You know, they're, they're part of your family. Marie Karen initiated the SEED program. And that's taking, taking things to, to a higher level of education to uh, help uh, young people uh, have the, the means to go to university, which uh, for us would be nothing. But what it costs them there is, is just beyond their means. It's a tiny village of 600 families. Families only make like four or five dollars a day and they've built a, a cinder block, it's about the size of half of a garage. And that garage is a haven for these kids after school. They, um, older students sometimes help them, but again, it's a safe place from the gangs. So this little tutoring center, they call it La Biblioteca, the library, um, is a safe place and we support that. And the students there still know we support them. So all the more reason, if they're brave enough to hold on to their dreams, I think I can't imagine anything more inspiring and humbling and just an all tremendously rewarding feeling to know that you are giving these kids hope and they deserve it. They deserve it. Sor Milagro is the head of the Santa Luisa School, and her name is appropriate because it's Sister Miracle. After seeing all that they were doing there, I still had ideas because I'm an educator. I was telling her all the things we could do, you know, I'm doing a lot of workshops with teachers and ideas, and, and she just sat there looking at me, just kind of quizzical. She kind of let me rant and rave, and I must have seemed like the total crazy American. 
but she just very patiently listened. And at the end of all my suggestions about what I was going to do the next time I came and what we could bring and what we could do, she looked at me and she said, you know, you can't think of enough ways to save these kids. And the, the truth is, they're going to end up saving you. And I think about that so many times because she was so right. They give you a, the perspective that, you know, the world doesn't revolve around us. These people are living life and death situations every day. And you don't forget that when you come back, when people are all up in arms about trivia. You want to just rein them in and say, why don't you come with me to El Salvador? I'd love for you to come just for a few days and see the way 80% of the world lives because they can teach you so much. They can teach you so much about patience and loving and strength and courage and kindness and generosity that has no bounds. In the midst of what they are experiencing and suffering, they appreciate your presence because that says you care. And what we do in this program is a big signal to them. Yes, we're in and out of your country. Guess what? We're thinking about you all year. Father Lally, he was always trying to get me to go to Israel with him on his trips, or to Mexico, or whatever. And I always avoided doing that because he's the adventurous one. I'm a uh, bookworm teacher, uh, not an activist. Uh, I love to read about travel. I have, I'm reading a travel book now. Uh, but vicarious traveling is what I really enjoy the most. And so finally, he left, and I said, good. Then Marie Karam grabs me, she says, you know, we need a chaplain for our trip to El Salvador uh, in June. And I said, no, you don't want me, you know, uh, I would be a liability. But she kept at me and she says, yeah, and you could be a chaperone for the student trip later that summer. Two trips in one summer? I said, oh dear. But I figured they gilded me into it, so I, I did it. My goal was survival, that's all I wanted to do. But uh, I got there and um, what I really discovered was I had absolutely nothing to give these people, but what they did was give me a lot. We give them something simply by listening to them. And what I came back and learned is that the same is true with all the people I meet on campus. If you take an interest in their lives and just ask them about what they're doing, that's what the going abroad taught me, is to take an interest in people. And that's a gift to them. I'm actually the first person in my family to go to a four-year college. My parents both came to the United States when they were teenagers as immigrants, and they wanted me to see what it's like to live on the other side. I didn't even want to leave El Salvador. I wasn't done learning. I wasn't done absorbing everything that I had seen there, and like I was not definitely done understanding why certain people had to go through such struggles in life. The only difference between them and us is they happen to be born in El Salvador and we happen to be born here. I think we're very blessed to live in a great country like this, and um, when you go to a country, be it El Salvador, or any um, more impoverished country than ours, um, it really just um, gives you a different perspective of what other people are experiencing. During our pre-trip meetings, uh, our chaperone Marie, she told us that we were gonna be treated like celebrities, they were going to cheer for us, they were going to be excited to see us. And you can have someone tell you that, but you don't really actually expect it. I was like, oh, she's just fluffing it up a little, like it'll be a nice experience. But they were all sitting waiting for us, and when they saw us, they cheered like I was One Direction or Taylor Swift. We walked into the Santa Luisa school and all the kids were ready for us in the courtyard and they were all uh, screaming and cheering for us when we walked in. It was just a great experience. I hear the roaring screams like I'm walking to a concert and they were just screaming for us and it was probably one of the most overwhelming experiences I have ever had. 
You want to have them have that culture shock so that it shakes them up and it wakes them up and they realize, you know, 80% of the world, a lot different. We primarily were going to different neighborhoods, talking to families, just getting a feel for what it was like to live in El Salvador and like, hearing some of the stories. We went to the beach one day and there was a, we had to bring a Red Cross lifeguard because the oceans there were really rough. And we started talking to the lifeguard and he said that he, he fought for the, on the government side in the Civil War. And the reason he did so was because he was addicted to drugs and was very depressed. And he just wanted to join the army so that if he died that his mother could get the money. There was like a, a stipend that you would get if you uh, died in the military for the government. The reason he became a Red Cross lifeguard was because uh, he wanted to save lives and he, after he came out of the Civil War he was um, really turned his life around and really wanted to do good for uh, his country. In the village where we have the scholarship program there is no law. There is no law. It's just survive. A lot of the resources were super limited so they had to use everything um, strategically and wisely whether it's water, food supply, anything in general. We just can't forget that they are up against extreme odds. It's not just the poverty, the gangs and the corruption and the drugs. We have kids in our program, the parents have been killed. And we're trying to support them and say, you have a dream, we're gonna help you achieve it. And all the mail we get from there is, I do have a dream. They all have dreams. Reflecting back and thinking how excited the students were to see us and how happy they were and how happy they were to just take a selfie or like throw up the peace sign and just be normal elementary school children. And once we left knowing that they had to go back to work in the streets for their family, I think that was very eye-opening and just hard to think about. They get up and they go to school and they all have dreams. And we have had success with these kids. My name is Gabriela Torres, and I study in Universidad de El Salvador. I study architecture, and I love my career and what I do. I want to show some of my university presentations and some subjects. Uh, this is a view of a late sensations. In this presentation, I got at a good grade. Uh, only one mistake. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Scranton University, for the opportunity that gives uh, many young people to find, to achieve our goals and dreams. And the world is a better place when we help and when now how to be grateful. I will be a great architect and I would like to help others. Thanks. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es William. Estudio la carrera de Administración de Empresas en la UCA junto al programa de becas mártires de la UCA. Y mi esperanza es terminar mi carrera, ayudar a mi familia a progresar y aportarle algo nuevo a la comunidad ayudando a los que van detrás de nosotros y creciendo juntos. Mi nombre es Kenia, estoy estudiando bachillerato con especialidad en consultoría. Mi esperanza es poder terminar mi bachillerato y tener mi carrera de licenciatura en administración de empresas. Eh, mi aporte es ayudar a la comunidad y seguir adelante. Hola, mi nombre es María Mercedes, eh, estoy estudiando en la UCA, estoy empezando la carrera de administración y ayudo también aquí en la biblioteca eh, con los niños y mi esperanza es eh, seguir ayudando para que la comunidad crezca. Eh, muy buen día, eh, mi nombre es César Omar, soy estudiante de Ingeniería Mecánica en la, en la UCA y de mi parte darle gracias a la Universidad de Scranton y pues mi, mi labor acá en la fundación es al igual que todos los becarios ayudar a los niños en sus tareas las cosas que no entienden, ya sea las de básica o secundaria. 
mi esperanza a futuro es terminar mi carrera, eh, poder, eh, poder entender y saber o tener bastante conocimiento en el área de lo que es la física y así poder ayudar a más jóvenes ya que lo que más se dificulta en la parte de bachillerato son las ciencias aplicadas que son física y entonces esas cosas. When you have students like that who succeed, and others who have become librarians or biology teachers, they know where they came from. So when people tell you, where does the money go? You know, I'm asking them to invest in these kids because I don't believe that you can't change the world. I know you can change the world for some people. And I know that by changing the world for some people, that has a ripple effect. And those kids are not forgetting the help that we're giving them. They're giving us back so much more, so much more. As soon as I got back, I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. Luckily, I was able to receive the position of to be a peer facilitator for the Guatemala service trip. I would love to be able to go back to developing nations and just maybe not even start a clinic, but like let's say just give out vaccinations, um, do some stitching, like let's say just do a yearly checkup, just do like a physical examination on them. If you learn how to treat a patient with such limited things in front of you, I feel like that can make you way, way far in advance and successful as a physician. We were going to El Salvador to go on a service experience and educate ourselves and learn a lot, but in the end we were the ones being served, getting to meet the students and be able to come back and share their stories and advocate for them. We're so lucky to attend a Jesuit university and have these experiences at our fingertips during these formative four years of our lives. Um, and looking back on my undergrad and finishing up my graduate year, uh, I don't really think about staying up till 2 a.m. in the library. I don't think about the tests I failed my freshman year, but I think about these experiences and these people that I've been able to meet and how these trips and these people I've kind of come in contact with and students that I've met through the university on different trips that I'm going to be friends with forever and be able to talk about these experiences. I think that's what a Jesuit education is and yes I'm going to graduate and become an occupational therapist but I'm going to be a better occupational therapist. I'm going to be a better person because of these experiences. I think after so many years it's so hard to get the message across. People, I don't think they understand that just a small investment in these kids makes a huge difference. The kids teach us a lot and they're gonna need anything we can give them. These kids have nothing and uh, they just need bus fare and things like that. And no one's gonna pay attention to them if we don't because they're just kids, a lot of them from the uh, marketplace and um, to see them all dressed in their best each day and just the enthusiasm they have for their education and just full of delight and joy. Uh, I can be a little melancholic in my older years, but they taught me, no, just let it go and just uh, have a good time. Learning to take delight in where you are, wherever that is, uh, that's what they taught me. We have several um, opportunities for people to donate uh, whether it's an uh, elementary student at the uh, Santa Luisa School or a student in Las Delicias, $60 will cover their materials and different things that they have to do during the year, sometimes even shoes or a little bit of medical costs because they don't really have something to cover that. Scholarships we have, you know, say $60 for an elementary school student, that is a tremendous gift because they get their backpack and their school supplies. You would think that they were all giving, given, you know, like a thousand dollars a week for life. It was just like, here's my backpack, here are my school supplies. I mean, I'm getting the goose pimples just telling you, it's a huge deal. Another way of contributing would be $80 for the bus on Saturday that takes them to the UCA. Anybody who wants to feel good about Saturday morning and realize these kids are getting up early in the morning and they're getting on that bus and they're seventh graders, eighth graders, high school kids, you just say, please, give them something. 4% usually only make it to ninth grade. Well, we have a higher percentage than that in this little village. Because on Saturdays, there is a bus that we pay for. 
that takes those students to the UCA and they get free tutoring by UCA students, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, because they're so far behind grade level. But the Jesuit University realizes that and working with our representative in the village, who is a, a lay Mary no missioner, every Saturday they spend the day at the UCA and from seventh grade to high school, they get tutored and they get confident and they persist and they keep going to school and they finish high school. And then if they're lucky, the UCA is very good. They have scholarships. A high school student would be $250 because that just helps cover the transportation because when they get to high school, they can't stay in the village. They have to actually take a bus and go somewhere. It doesn't cover everything. But $250 makes it possible for them, and we hold that out for them, and we kind of make sure they have it if we run into problems. But at least that way they know we support you. Ninth grade, you can do it. Just keep going. And after high school, we can still help. You know, you have that dream to be the computer uh, scientist or the biology teacher, or, you know, one kid wanted to be a chef. Um, whatever it is, you know, we'll be there for you. So just keep dreaming because we're going to be here. We're not going anywhere. And I mean, we're not going anywhere. As long as we're able to do it, uh, we're going to continue to go back to El Salvador. We're going to continue with the SEED program and the Bridges to El Salvador program and anything else that may may uh, spark out from that uh, and hopefully engage other people with a desire to do the same. At some point we will pass out of the scene but hopefully the commitment and the desire uh, for this kind of brotherhood, sisterhood with people uh, in a faraway place uh, will continue.